The Atheist Debates Patreon Project presents a conversation with Dr. Anthony Penn, Professor of Religious Studies, Rice University, Houston, Texas. I didn't know very much about you. I knew you were here. Yeah. Was, and it was actually later than that when I started going through some of your books and some of the talks that I found out that not only had you, like I was raised active in the church, yeah. but you were super active. In oh, the, man. You were raised, kind of, were you raised, do you think you were raised to be a preacher or... How did you become a child preacher? Well, I mean, we spent a whole lot of time in church. For as long as I can remember, church was kind of a second family, right? Free time spent in the church, a huge influence. And I don't know that I was actually being groomed for ministry. Um, I was just being groomed to be an active part of the church, whatever role that ended up being is what it would end up being. But I think at least within black church culture, Young people, particularly young men who don't get in much trouble, right, uh, say the right thing, seem kind of socially okay and are doing well in school, uh, he's going to be a preacher, right? Because that, that is premier social status, right? He's going to be a preacher. Um, and so I, I went through this process. We were a part of this Baptist church uh, outside of Buffalo, New York. Both, both branches of my family moved from the South to Buffalo because of job opportunities, right? The steel industry. Uh, my, on my mother's side, my grandparents were college educated, but in North Carolina, that, <laughs> that didn't really, it didn't really matter, right? Their blackness trumped their education. So they moved looking for opportunities, the steel industry. They joined a small Baptist church, and that's where we would go. And it reached a point where that was no longer okay for my mother, right? The idea that we were being, we were being trained within a context where women were secondary because they were women. That's not what she wanted for us. So we left and uh, became a part of a non-denominational church that eventually became Methodist. I joined that church, and one Sunday during Sunday school, the minister asked what kids wanted to be, and I said I wanted to be a preacher. I, I don't know why. It's not like my family was flooded with ministers, so it wasn't a model that was active in my extended family. I just said, this is what I want to be, and he took me up on it, and I started by lining hymns and opening the doors of the church, leading prayers, that sort of thing, and uh, eventually, um, while I was a preteen, gave my first sermon, and boom, I was on my way. I'm youth pastor of this church, and went to school in New York City and was the youth pastor at a rather large Methodist church. And it, the assumption was, you know, I don't make any major mistakes, nothing that couldn't be prayed away or theologically altered, right? That if I kind of did things the way they needed to be done, I, you know, I'd have quite a career, quite a career. I was connected to the right people in the right churches. And on that front, I guess, there's some similarities in our background because while I wasn't preaching as a child, I did grow up in a Baptist church. And I recall, you know, most of the kids in our youth group um, who were the most active in the church, not the ones who just came from time to time, uh, there wasn't so much an expectation, but it's, it's, it's looking back on it, it's kind of odd how many of them felt called to the ministry. Mm -hmm. This was going to be what they did. Um, this was um, something that people thought I was supposed to do. I have other friends who went on to become youth yeah. ministers and things like that. Uh, I ran away from it because I was yeah. afraid of public speaking, which is kind of... <laughs> yeah, it is. But, um, so you, you, you got involved in this and, and you were working with the church, which, which is kind of common. Um, at what point did, did you start recognizing that maybe there was something up. How, yeah. how did you begin yeah. your transition out? Well, this is what happened to me. I, I ended up spending my last three years of high school in a small Southern Baptist high school outside of Buffalo. It was a feeder program for schools like uh, Bob Jones University. Right? Enough said. We know about Bob Jones University. But one of the more tragic dimensions of that education was the way in which it took away critical thinking skills. Because right? that wasn't rewarded. What does the Bible say? So I get to New York and I'm in classes where critical thinking is what it's all about. The Bible is being treated like just a piece of literature. I didn't have a good way of processing that and nobody seemed afraid that they were going to hell, right? Because I had the truth clearly, but no one was afraid of hell. And this is what really got me. Some of these people who weren't Christian, weren't saved, treated me better than a lot of the church people. 
And this just kind of threw me. And I was having a difficult time reconciling what I was doing in church with what I was encountering in the world that we seemed to be answering questions that people weren't asking and shying away from the questions that people actually did ask, right? This was the age of crack cocaine. It, crack cocaine had just come on the scene as I'm approaching New York, and that altered life in major ways. And we weren't providing anything that was really substantive, right? People were literally dying. I was running across young people who had an easier time planning out their deaths than they did planning out a bright future. And I had not much to say. And I'm a minister, right? I'm not just a typical Christian. This is the highest calling, right? I'm called by God to do this thing. And I, I'm, I'm telling people stuff that really isn't making a damn difference on Monday. Is it primarily this issue of we've got our stock sermons and our platitudes that we would like to think guide people in every aspect of their life. And as it turns out, um, we may not have good yeah. information for the modern problems. Well, and for me, it revolved around a central question. Theologians call it the Odyssey, right? The, what can you say about God in light of human suffering in the world? And my response to that was a typical Christian response, but it was a ass backward response in that it, it made suffering redemptive. That Christianity, as I preached it and understood it, was about transforming suffering into something that was glorious. How could it be otherwise when the major figure, Jesus the Christ, takes care of business, kind of saves the world through this suffering? And so Christians are trying to model this. So no matter how creative I tried to be in terms of my sermons, my prayers, my conversations, it was all based upon a model that really didn't value human life. Right? It didn't value what took place within the context of human history. It looked beyond human history and said, you may deal with a whole lot of shit here, but you're going to get heaven. That's not a good way to help people move through the world. It doesn't help them make any sense. Of no, it. no. And so I'm wrestling with this, and my idea of God, my idea of world, my idea of salvation is, is changing. I moved from an idea of a God who is all-powerful, who makes things happen, who breaks into human history, to a God who tries to operate based upon persuasion, what my grandmother would call that still small voice, right, that tries to urge us to do the right. right? I'm moving in this direction, trying to remain committed to Christian ministry, but thinking about ministry differently. So one of my models became a Adam Clayton Powell Jr., this New York minister who was really about transforming the socioeconomic and political conditions of life. And church ministry became a vehicle for doing that worldly work. That was making sense to me. So I was going to stay in Christian ministry. I decided that I couldn't, I couldn't go to seminary in New York because I needed to be away from folks so that I could really wrestle with questions. Mm -hmm. So I, I moved to Massachusetts to a school where ministry was really a secondary thought. It didn't matter much. And so I'm trying to work all this stuff out, but it reached a point where I had to make a decision. Was I about the Christian tradition or was I about helping people make it in the world? And I decided helping people make it in the world was more important. So I left the church, told the minister I was working with that I would not be continuing that ministry, contacted my bishop, wrote to my bishop to surrender my ordination and just left. And what was the response like from, from both family yeah. and from the people you were That's the with? thing, you know, my, my situation was rather mild. I didn't, no one disowned me, I wasn't ostracized, wasn't kicked out of the family. In fact, my mother who had moved into ministry as I was leaving just said to me, look, we disagree on this, I pray you come back, but even if you don't, you're my son, you're my blood, and I love you, period. My siblings were like, oh, whatever. You know, this is just only whatever. Extended family, man, we disagree, but whatever. He's family. Friends, people who were actually my friends stuck around. Those who weren't left, better off without them. So I still had this strong core of folks who appreciated me for what I was as opposed to what I did or didn't believe. Because many of them were hiding out. They agreed with me, but they weren't going to say it publicly. And I could see the, the case for, for attacks of people. We talk about what happens to someone that causes them to lose their yeah. faith. And I, I could imagine people saying, well, you didn't go to the right school or you were educated away from yeah. this. Um, you went to seminary and lost Jesus. Which happens so often, yeah. uh, especially in seminaries that have you know, critical examples. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. 
But I, I think there's a, kind of a, an amazing irony in your case because there is a view of Jesus. There's a number of views of Jesus, yeah. as we're aware, uh, that is about helping people. Right. And weren't you perhaps doing something far more Christ-like in some respects than the ministers who were objecting to you leaving? I, I would think so. I think in a lot of ways, when I became a humanist, when I became an atheist, I was a better Christian than most Christians because it was really about helping people. Nothing else mattered. Helping people, not preserving a tradition, right? But helping people. A and so, uh, again, most people were okay with my approach. I've had more difficulty with other academics than I've had with family and friends. That other people who study, particularly people who study African American religion, many of them dislike me deeply. Now there be lots of reasons for disliking me. I, I understand on occasion I can be an ass, right? Not the easiest person. But for many of them, they dislike me because I've surrendered the tradition. For them, I'm outside of the tradition. I've lost my blackness, right? I've embraced the enlightenment and the white world and just kind of lost my connection to community as a result. And my attitude is, well, whatever. So let's take a moment to talk about that because you know, as we continue to build a larger secular movement, yeah. a lot of discussion about uh, African Americans being underrepresented, upper, underrepresented, and uh, as many uh, hypotheses about how to fix that as there are people in the movement. Sure, sure. But there's there's this idea, and whether or not it's true is, is I guess, what what I was wondering, that there's a significant difference between the traditional, perhaps Southern black churches or black church in general, if you go to a Baptist church that is primarily filled with African Americans and is led by an African American yeah. minister, how different is that from the Southern Baptist church that I grew up in? And how do those differences, what do those differences tell us about what we need to do to yeah. address those people? There are some nuanced differences, but by and large, black Methodists are black Methodists, whether they're in New York or they're in Daytona Beach or some small town in Texas. Black Methodists are black Methodists. So I don't know that that's the way we get at it. I, I think there are some things that within the movement we have to be aware of. One, a kind of blanket condemnation, and let, let's think in terms of African Americans moving into the movement, right? Because the number of African Americans who are outside of black churches, for example, and who are looking for something else is radically increasing, right? So if we think in terms of African Americans, the blanket condemnation um, doesn't work. So one question that doesn't work for most African Americans is this, why would you embrace the religion that was used to enslave you? Right? Uh, on, and it doesn't work for a couple of reasons. One, for every person who was okay with their slavery as a result of the Christian faith, you've got folks like Denmark Vesey, Gabriel Prosser, Nat Turner, who used Christianity as a way to whoop some ass, right? Their attitude was, yeah, we believe in God, we're ministers, but God wants us to be free, and if some white folks have to die in the process, they die in the process, right? So it wasn't all, this is wonderful, I'm content to be a slave, no. People were picking up weapons as a result of this. So how Christianity has functioned historically in black communities, there's, there's some thickness there, there's some complexity that that question overlooks. Right, so there, we've got to be mindful of why people moved into Christianity, and not all, not all of the reasons revolve around kind of spiritual renewal. There were pragmatic, kind of mundane reasons to associate with this, and that this moves through history. So folks will say, A. Philip Randolph, well, he was a churchman. No, he tithed. Why? Because as a labor guy, he knew that black churches were an easy way to get the attention of large groups quickly. And paying his tithe was like paying his union dues. But he wasn't a Christian, he was an atheist, right? So there's a complexity there that we cannot, cannot, cannot overlook. We also have to be mindful of the fact that for enslaved Africans, humanists, free thinkers, skeptics, whatever we want to call them, did not provide a compelling alternative. They held slaves too. So lots of folks, for example, will embrace and celebrate Thomas Jefferson. Wonderful dude, right? Free thinker, but he held slaves. <laughs> so with the, the question, the way we get at this, has to one, recognize that there are lots of reasons black folks have been theists. 
Secondly, we have to recognize that historically humanists and free thinkers, atheists, whatever we want to call them, have not necessarily provided an alternative. And now we've got to correct for that. As opposed to how dare, how could you be a Christian, right? And why wouldn't you just embrace what we have? Well, show us why it's compelling. It's often so saturated with enlightenment thinking that it kind of forgets that out of the enlightenment you have some robust arguments for the inferiority of Africans. Right? So we've got to have a much more complex conversation if we're going to make this appealing to African Americans. I've had similar conversations with uh, Jamila and Alex Jules and, and this idea of, um, yes, the Bible advocates for slavery. Exodus, Leviticus, Deuteronomy. And, yeah. But there's been a shift in the Christian church that we may not have seen perhaps other religions where uh, it feels so much better to just generally focus on the New Testament, forget about the Old. And there, there are reasons for that in the sense that it, uh, there are some things, don't get me wrong, I will object to New Testament doctrine perhaps more than Old Testament yeah. in some cases, but there are some things about New Testament doctrine that begin to uh, uh, address a more positive aspect of people. You know, turn the other cheek and, and sell your belongings and give it to the poor. And what we, what some people fail to see is that what primarily uh, poor African-American women are getting out of church is not, oh yes, this is the, the Bible that was used to enslave mm -hmm. me. It's no, this is my community, this is my family, this is where I go mm -hmm. uh, to interact with people. Yeah. Are, do we, we'll talk a little bit about kind of the academic arguments that we have about the existence of God and the philosophy aspect, but how, how much time should we spend on that versus mm -hmm. how much time should we spend addressing people's needs and talking about the person. Got to focus on the needs. And in part because theology mutates, it shifts. It's a second order enterprise. That is to say that theology responds to experience. And so it will shift and change. I mean, this is one of the reasons churches have survived. Their thinking shifts and changes. But what people need on a daily basis, how they make it through life, and for humanists and atheists, the kind of soft landing we can give them when they leave is what we need to concentrate on. So simply, simply ripping up the Bible, I mean, it's not going to, with certain communities, not going to get us a lot. So for example, African American Christians have always been selective in how they read the Bible. Because whether you take the Hebrew Bible or the New Testament, there's no condemnation of slavery. In the Hebrew Bible, it's just don't mess with my people, but you can wipe out the Canaanites, the Moabites, the Hittites, right? So it's who gets enslaved, not does slavery exist? Jesus never condemns it. His disciples are deeply sexist, right? The New Testament is, is deeply sexist. There's, there's again, no condemnation of, of racism, right? of, of slavery. So people, African-Americans have always They've always been selective with respect to how they read scripture. So we're not going to get a, not going to gain a whole lot of ground by simply ripping that away from them. They've always manipulated it. The question becomes, do we allow them a way to maintain their humanity, their dignity, their identity? Because Christianity on some level works well because it requires people to surrender something of themselves, right? It requires them to surrender some of their dignity, some of their worth. To encourage cooperation and community. And the body is suspect within these traditions, right? The body is a problem. Now, think about the body as a problem for a race of people who have been belittled and dehumanized based on the look of their body. Now, humanists and atheists offer them, from my perspective, a more useful alternative, an alternative that allows them to appreciate and understand the beauty of their bodies. Right, that it's all about how this body moves through time and space, what this body needs and what it offers. We can do that much better than Christian churches and other theistic outfits. Yeah, there's this idea that in some Christians head and, and in the general public, because Christians are a really good propaganda machine, that the New Testament, the teachings of Jesus, kind of are you know, Bible 2.0 and overturn some stuff and have vast improvements. And not only is there no additional condemnation of slavery, but the only time that it's mentioned is, you know, slaves obey your masters, including the cruel ones. Yeah. And for me, this is... And Philemon, go back. Yeah. And, and for me, this is, this is one of the, the kind of knockdown arguments for both the Bible is a good book or this yeah. being the word of any sort of wise yeah. being, 
how hard would it have been to say, thou shalt not own another person as property, and it gets it exactly backwards. It doesn't just forget to mention it. It says the opposite. Right. And it, it yeah, yeah. Drives me crazy. And I think that there are so many other texts that provide so much useful food for thought. Now, they will have their problems, but at least those problems can be addressed because they're not caught up in some kind of cosmic blueprint, right? They're, they're not provided by this cosmic force that you can't critique and, and correct. So for my money, a, a text like Walden by Thoreau provides a way to move through the world that makes sense, that's useful, that is transformation-minded. Or the writings of someone like Richard Wright provide a way to think and move through the world that are mindful of the pitfalls and kind of give a way to think about progress that's much more realistic, that doesn't short circuit our effort to make a difference here and now. So we don't need that text. We've got others that get the job done. So right now, you're a professor of religious studies here yeah. at Christ. Um, a lot of my focus is on public academic debates, mm -hmm. but I also do informal debates and, and have conversations with family and friend. How often do you engage in the sort of debate-like discussions, either formal or informal, yeah. Uh, versus your focus, which is generally on educating people yeah. and, and getting good information out. Knowledge is power, and it seems to me that, that there are a variety of ways to get at that, in, in part because the population is complex, and so we need more than one way of approaching people, of being engaged and sharing knowledge. So uh, debate is significant, it's important, and then there are other ways to get this information across as well. So I, I spend less time debating now in part because I have less time, right? So I've kind of tried to divide this up and try to get people thinking about these issues because my attitude is if we can develop generations of critical thinkers, none of this stuff will be a problem, right? If, if we can get people thinking critically about the world, they'll dismiss some of this nonsense, right? So I, I, I see myself as having a primary obligation both on and off campus to help people develop their critical thinking skills and then giving them case studies, one of them being religion. So now as a critical thinker, what do you, what do you think about the Bible? What do you think about this? What do you think about the prosperity gospel, right? What do you think about mega churches, right? And give them information and opportunity to critically engage it. And it seems to me that in a different format and a different venue, that's what debate does as well. So long term, what do you, the grand vision, yeah. what do you want to see, what kind of world do you want to see? I, I want to see a world that's actually democratic in thought and practice, that values life on a variety of levels and understands the human as a small component of this web of life with large, expansive responsibilities. I want a world in which we are critically engaged, critical thinkers who are about the business of nurturing valuing and safeguarding life. And I think if we do that, problems we have with theism will slowly go away and problems that are embedded in humanism and atheism will be recognized, addressed, and go away. And on that front, talking about you know, problems in the, in, in the humanist and secular communities, um, what would you like to see from the secular community? What, what can we do better? I mean, a part, we, we talked about, yeah. about making sure we're, we're dealing with people and, and their issues and giving a place to land. Um, I don't know if, if perhaps there's something where we're shooting ourselves in the foot, but, you know, ultimately, my goal is yeah. to make the secular community irrelevant. You know, I, I want to end religion. <laughs> but what are we doing, what are we doing or not doing now that we could be or shouldn't be? I, I think one of the things we really have to do is recognize that logic and reason are not a prophylactic against stupid shit, right? That you can be logical and a person who operates based upon reason and still be racist, sexist, classist, you name it. But this idea that that's all embedded in what these religious, what these theists do, and I'm, I'm a reasonable person, so of course I don't, I'm not a racist because racism isn't reasonable. Uh, yeah, it's got to be more than this, right? So kind of recognize that we have internal issues that have to be addressed, right? Internal issues that have to be addressed. And I think there are ways in which 
from my perspective, we have to recognize that humanism and atheism can't simply be thought, they have to be lived. And that, that means a addressing the stuff of daily life, right? Giving folks a way to practice this rather than simply think about it. So when, you're in, when you do engage in discussions with this, do you, do you perhaps, are you different when you talk to people, family, friends, than you are with academics? Do you maybe take it easy? You know, it's all, it's my aunt, and so I'm- I only have one speed, only one way to think about this and do it. So I, I tend to engage people the same way, whether they're family, friends, or the person at the convention who asks a question, right? It's, everybody gets a little bit of the same sort of thing. So it, for the people who are maybe, you know, they found their way free of religion and they're, they're trying to uh, convey this information to people who are questioning them, mm -hmm. uh, it, but perhaps they don't necessarily have enough information, they don't necessarily have a good tool set, maybe they're like Moses and need somebody else to speak for them, uh, but do you have any advice for, for how they can start building uh, better arguments, mm -hmm. or is building better arguments a mistake? Is it perhaps more along the lines of building themselves up as a better human being? I, I, a couple of things. One, I think we have to recognize why people are theist, right? Why people are Buddhist or Hindu or is, you know, Muslim or Christian. Understand what it does for them, right? And, and begin our conversation and the critique mindful of why they are involved. I think that's extremely important. But I think we also then have to make certain that our debate points kind of line up with our activities, that what we say is consistent with what we are actually doing in the world. And I think if those two things are taken care of, the arguments develop because we're not simply talking to people, we're demonstrating what we do. We've got kind of a, a better understanding than just Here's another script. And right. Because they don't just want something they can think. They want something they can do that will help them get through the world. And so we've got to approach that on both levels. There's got to be something about our conversation that's mirrored in our actions in the world. But for, so a lot of African Americans will look at humanists and atheist organizations, this movement in general, and think about things like Ferguson and wonder how long it will take these organizations to respond to these sorts of travesties, right? When they respond so quickly to the Ten Commandments being posted somewhere. <laughs> but but here, here is a black man killed and we can be fairly slow to move into that conversation, right? So we've got to give people through our, not only our conversation, but our actions a reason to take us seriously. So is there, is there a particular argument from apologists that you just wish would like go away? It's like the worst thing ever and yet it just keeps coming up. The thing that, that theist will say that I, it's, at this point it's just amusing to me is you can't possibly be moral and ethical because you have no God. They don't know much about their God and what their God has condoned, right? I'm, it used to just annoy me. Now it tickles me when they make that argument. Because they're teeing up a softball at that <laughs> Yeah, that, that's easy. Is there, um, what's kind of the biggest lie that ministers relay to their congregants about the secular community? Is that it? <laughs> It comes around to, yes, that they cannot be moral and ethical because they have no God. And I have, I, I'm working on a series uh, of videos where I... Oh, oh, and just one more thing on that, I'm sorry. And within the context of black churches, the other thing that is just a straight up lie is that humanism and atheism aren't black. Black people haven't done this. The only black people who do this are the black people who are trying to be white. There's a, there's a series of videos where I'm going to be talking about the bad arguments that we make. And uh, I'm actually kind of stealing this from a couple of Christian sites when they were having the creationism evolution debate. Yeah. Like, here's some arguments we don't think you know, creationists would use. Uh, and I'm putting together some that, uh, from my opinion, and the yeah, opinion, yeah. opinion of others, you know, I'm not the arbiter of good arguments, but I should be. But, uh, what is a, an argument that you hear from atheists that you wish we would just stop making? 
Well, it's it's more of an uh, it's an it's something that's implied, not always stated. That theists are stupid. That's that's pretty much near the top of the list. That is just you, you can't have a conversation after that. And it's also ridiculous. For, it's just for people like you and I. My IQ did not go up. Exactly. Exactly. I didn't. You know, I, I didn't lose my ability to read. <laughs> I mean, that is just a ridiculous argument. So is there any, so you're, you've written, I don't know, a gazillion books? Now? <laughs> uh, the last one was um, Writing God's Obituary. Is that the last one that came out? Is there a new one since then? There's some, uh, there's some stuff related to uh, uh, hip hop. Someone had emailed me and asked me to say, hey, have you seen this? Um, you should talk to Tony Penn sometime and see about some work he did with a rapper at some point. Oh, know. Bun B. Yeah, yeah we, co -teach, we co teach a course. You want to tell us a little bit about it? Yeah, it? well, it's at, we, we start. I, I'd been teaching um, uh, courses related to religion and hip hop for uh, roughly 20 years now, um, in part because I've been a hip hop fan for longer than that. Right. I think there's just something significant about that cultural development, that here you have something that develops in the urban decay of New York City that has gone on to influence the world. And, and so I've been teaching this course off and on. I came to Houston, and some of my favorite artists are here. So I tried to get them in the classroom. One of them was Bun B from the group uh, The Underground Kings, and we had a conversation. He lectured in my course. I invited him to co-teach the class with me. And this, the class on campus has gone really, really well. Rice is a fairly small university, and we capped the course at 200. So for Rice, that's huge. And we were getting phone calls and email messages from folks off campus wondering how they could get into this course. So now we offer an online version free of charge it's a six-week course. There are no hidden fees. Even the required readings we provide for free. And we look at the relationship between hip-hop and Christianity and Islam. We look at hip-hop's critique of theism. And then we look at hip-hop as a replacement for traditional forms of religion. Uh, so it's been, it's been really interesting. In the residential course, we also look at humanism and humanism's relationship to hip-hop culture. The six-week course, we just don't have the time. But my argument has been the humanists and atheists need to take seriously hip-hop. Now, I'm not saying people have to be fans. They don't need to go out and buy Jay-Z or Kanye West. That's not my argument. But in the context of the United States, humanists and atheists represent a despised population. Hip-hop comes from a despised population. Yet they have grown and secured the appreciation and the support of a huge, huge audience. We have not. We might want to learn something from them concerning branding, marketing, promotion, right? How is it that these young people from the Bronx develop something that is now global, embraced by all classes, all races, right? I mean, it's, how have they done this? Humanists and atheists, arguably, with more resource, better placement, haven't done this. They have a diversity within hip-hop culture that we could only dream of having. And it can't just be that they're, so, so there's, there's a wide range of messages within hip-hop. Yeah. Some of them are incredibly negative. Some oh, yeah. Some positive, and yet both of them uh, have managed to gain popularity. Yeah. Now, I'm, I'm certainly not going to be advocating for let's push negative messages. No, no. Us, but I, we have a positive yeah. message. Yeah. I think there should be some yeah. way uh, that we can learn. Oh, yeah. And it seems to me, yeah, we've got to critique what comes out of hip hop, but critiquing it, recognizing that they are describing a world that we've given them. Yes. Right. But, but again, for me, it's not so much about the content, it's the form. How is it they have promoted this thing and made it global? And we've not been able to do that, right? So there's, there's stuff we need to learn from them in terms of strategy, marketing. On one level, I think what they've done extremely well is they've developed a vocabulary, a grammar that is organic, that is their own. We continue to allow theists to dictate the terms of engagement, right? We've got to do this differently. Hip hop 
refuse to let the dominant, the dominant society determine how it spoke and what it spoke. We need a very different strategy that's more along the lines of what hip hop has done. So that, and for me, that's just one example, but there's just so much we can learn from them in terms of branding, marketing, et cetera. So on, kind of touching base on that with regard to like prescriptivism and language, uh, of all the possible labels that you could use, which ones do you prefer for, to identify yourself to the public? I mean, is it atheist? Is it secularist, humanist, you know? Humanist. Humanist is what I typically use. Now, in terms of publications, it's often atheist, but that's for a variety of reasons. One being atheism sells more books than humanism sells, right? So some of that is just how presses understand this thing. So, so for example, the book you mentioned, Writing God's Obituary, the subtitle was How a Good Methodist Became a Better Humanist but atheist is going to have more impact. So I said, okay, we can change the label, but I typically go with, with humanist. Well, I want to thank you for doing this. Oh, my I pleasure. Thank it. you. I'm glad to, to drive out here. I know everybody's uh, going to love it. And uh, hopefully we get to do this again. And you know, I'll see you at America. Yeah, I'll see you in Memphis. Also, uh, other times as well. If nothing else, we'll go get some barbecue. <laughs> this video is made possible by supporters of the Atheist Debates Patreon project. You can find more information and add your support at patreon.com slash atheistdebates.